the large manufacturing firm uh, is really been a vector of citizenship at work. And some of you were at the opening plenary this morning. So some of the things that we were talking about uh, seem to be exactly the opposite of uh, Amazons as, as, as we know them. Uh, you think of the uh, large firm and, and this brilliant book uh, edited by Michel Couture on uh, Citoyenneté au Travail. Uh, uh, yeah, the, and you think of stable, unionized, typically gendered jobs in the manufacturing workplace. And that's the industrial uh, workplace. It's the large firm. Uh, the history of the creation and growth of industrial unions uh, against the absolutism of management rights, job control unionism, which our dearly departed colleague Jacques Belanger so aptly illustrated in a range of, of situations with these stable internal labor markets governed by seniority, what Larry Haven called the, the crown jewel of North American industrial relations, um, because it doesn't exist elsewhere in that way, but we think that it does. Uh, this, this idea of absolute seniority, uh, you know, I'm a nurse with same, a single mother with three children, uh, but I don't have seniority, so I should take my holiday in November uh, uh, so that someone else can, can take theirs uh, in July when the children are, are uh, uh, not, at, not at, on holiday. Um, so job control unionism, but yielding a stable, skilled workforce to ensure the continuity of production, positive labor law and expanded social rights, uh, reinforced by worker support for political parties advocating for a providential welfare state, a virtuous circle of Fordism with Keynesian demand management, collective bargaining, wage increase, mass consumption, economic growth, and sh uh, shared prosperity. But as you know, this citizenship um, ran into a spot of bother. Uh, but just before I, whoops, what happened there? There was disruption. Yeah, it's a it's a spot of bother for sure. Uh, so so using the crimped framework of of you know when you're when you're templated uh, this idea of economic and social risks, the idea of autonomy and control, the idea of uh, expressiveness. In particular, we want to emphasize this social value of work that it's meaningful, fulfilling, useful, sustainable. There are learning opportunities through the acquisition of new skills, the ability to build a career um, and a social identity. And, and you remember this morning when I was talking about the quotation from the worker at Amazon saying, I thought that this was gonna be my last job, that this is where I was going to prosper and build uh, a career. Uh, and this is very much the industrial enterprise as well. Um, opportunity to influence mechanisms of collective representation, some call it sometimes called voice, and even the possibility of contributing to the social, economic, and democratic life of the community, um, policies and practices to ensure expressiveness at work, et cetera. Now, we know about the disruptors. I won't spend any time on this, but globalization, financialization, fracturing of the firm, fissuring of employment, digitalization, the climate crisis, bang, bang, bang. Uh, all of this has an impact. Oops. What's the impact? Well, one hypothesis is that of diminished citizenship at work. Uh, all of these things put increased economic and social risk, put greater pressures on autonomy and control, and decrease scope for expressiveness. And I think that some of these things are going to come out from what uh, other presentations are going to tell us about some of the firms that we're looking at in this project. Another possibility is what we call circumscribed uh, citizenship. And that is that you maintain traditional citizenship for the core group, but anyone else, uh, forget it, uh, as work is outsourced, shrinking boundaries of the firm, shrinking boundaries of the firm, um, and uh, a multiplication of status and employment regimes of people working side by side. The third one is fragmented citizenship, where there's now a variable geometry. In particular, new hires don't have the same rights as the old hires. Uh, and the fourth one is subordinated citizenship. And that is really where new technologies increase subordination by decreasing autonomy and control over work, 
uh, Shoshana Zuboff has portrayed this frightening future in, in eloquent ways. And uh, as we shall see, uh, there's a reality to this in multiple ways. Now, there is an idea as well uh, for those who are more on the side that the glass is 1 16th full rather than 15 16 empty, uh, is that new opportunities for countervailing power and forms of governance that neutralize the scope or depth of, of citizenship at work to reduce the scope of citizenship at work, new regulatory approaches to enhance citizenship as we want to think about new rights around tech change, around climate change, or uh, the upgrading of skills to enhance expressiveness and meaning at work, um, and revamped, uh, bless them, human resource policies to enhance citizenship through the res res resolution of labor, reputational, and other problems. And I think we're going to have an eloquent uh, a testimony from René Claude and Isabelle and, and colleague uh, on uh, CSR, social innovation, and so on, in the sense that this is this is another way of taking forward an idea of some form of citizenship at work, but the 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 firm becomes a comfortable place in which you can innovate socially uh, and it does good things. So our case study, a large multinational uh, will make it anonymous, anonymous uh, over multiple decades. We have multiple uh, uh, methods, some participant uh, observation, uh, interviews, and we will confess uh, a, a consulting contract, which sounds fancy, but all it meant is that they needed our expertise, uh, but we couldn't talk about it. So we're not. Uh, but it's it's in the background because it was really very interesting to to end up talking to people in this kind of firm all over the world, uh, and they were quite interested in the results. Um, now we're breaking it into periods. How am I doing time wise, Patrice? Sorry, I, I lost the point of departure. You will still have eight minutes. Perfect. Okay. For one, th this is this is kind of kind of simple. You have a a, a classic. Uh, industrial citizenship firm, limited, limited subcontracting, relative long-term industrial peace, job control unionism, wages well above market rates, uh, production sites mostly uh, unionized, and a kind of regional paternalism uh, uh, in jobs for natural resources type of pact. Uh, period two, a takeover by a foreign, foreign multinational. I wonder which one that could be. Um, financial crisis ripples, ripples through, and it's a period of considerable neoliberal experimentation as they do various things around the scope of operations and the organization of production, uh, contempted, uh, contested attempts to outsource, standardization and integration, uh, but the Canadian operations remain the benchmark, so, so that's quite important. In increasing distance of local managers uh, and workers from decision-making centers, erosion of the autonomy of the Canadian subsidiary, regional identity remains quite important. And in terms of union management uh, strategies, a, a lot more conflict uh, around subcontracting, around uh, different aspects of uh, uh, the, the symbolism of the firm, threats of closure, uh, the, the traditional ta-da, ta-da, ta-da about when you're going to have conflict over, over these issues. And there was visibly a management strategy to destabilize traditional and regional industrial citizenship. And people felt it, but they put up the regional um, uh, defense mechanisms. So uh, it was always bound to fail. Uh, now, the third period is, it, it's a stalemate experimentation around investment where the union becomes much more open to saying, okay, well, what can we trade off in order to secure the future of the firm to have, it's all about when you're in a multinational of this type uh, on global markets, it's all about securing future investments, then there's sunk costs. You can't leave this kind of firm and say, okay, we're, we're relocating. Uh, the sunk costs are so high that that it gives a lot of torque to the union at the same time. And honestly, the, the neoliberal strategies were not a success. Uh, you know, the multinational comes in and thinks we can do this and we can do that, but it, it doesn't work like that. It's not as easy as they, as they and, and uh, 
So, but there's, there's a problem of disengagement of increased workplace conflict, et cetera. And this takes us to a last period of more negotiations over new investments. Climate change is coming in in a big way, which everyone is worried about, but they're not quite sure what to do uh, about it. Um, managers are caught between short-term paramount performance obligations and long-term capacity to ensure agility and technologically sophisticated productive capacities. For those who, of you who know multinationals, they're, they're faddish. They run on, around fads. They're often very bad ideas that come from consultants. Uh, and what people do in local firms is they try and neutralize the damaging effect of these, these strategies while waiting them out. And here are some of the kinds of things that are happening, but it's opening up a space and this is somehow why we're involved of saying, well, we really have to think about this differently. We have to think about technological change differently. We have to think about, think about the greening of skills in different ways. Uh, so where does that take us? Um, well, complicated table to say, there's not a lot of change happening on economic and social risk, despite the fact that they tried to fissure and outsource, but it didn't really work that well. There's a lot more stress on autonomy and control. And now they have the ability to run global operations from a room like this, uh, wherever you want to locate it, uh, though that has its own problems in terms it doesn't always work as, 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 as expressed. And the expressiveness is one where um, it's been hesitant and the unions are also feeling their way of saying, well, can we do things differently? Can we get engaged in social dialogue? And this is not meant to be a wishy-washy social democratic presentation. Matthew would never permit it. But uh, there is that element of people are quite uncertain about what they should actually be doing. And this opens up some space as well. And it's probably not unfamiliar to other people who know uh, industrial locations. So the conclusions are that it's a, a circumscribed citizenship question mark where there have been transformations, some vertical disintegration, but fissuring hasn't occurred, and the scope of but the scope of activities has been reduced. So the, the, the workforce is going down constantly. The labor management relations are being recalibrated with a change of ownership uh, and uncertainty relative to environmental and technological disruptions. Um, on economic and social risks. There's a fair degree of stability, but pressures on pensions in particular, marked increase in the number of jobs, on autonomy and boundaries. As I say, there's lots of uh, pressures on expressivity. Everyone is looking for new strategies after going through this period of conflict. So overall, regional and local actors lack institutional support to negotiate these transition. It's a work in progress. The state is active to enhance investments, but doesn't seem to care two hoots about the rest of it, uh, and is largely absent on skills and training issues, which are key, and those are key for the future of the industry. And they're now becoming active within industry forums of saying, okay, what do we do all about this? And when you say, what do you do about this? You're, you're also saying the following, that, that we used to think that um, all of this would be easy, but now you can hire people who don't have the basic skills, uh, who haven't completed high school. Uh, someone was telling us recently that uh, at the job fairs, they were taking people with criminal records that they'd never done before, uh, thinking about uh, how this would be possible. And uh, it's because you can have not finished high school and be making $120,000 a year uh, doing this kind of industrial job. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, not having the basic skill set that you probably need. And this isn't a, you know, uh, you, you just don't have all the training that you did have. So they're having to think, what do we do? How do we think this through? And if this is in a big industrial citizenship firm, then think about the people down the food chain in terms of who's supplying this firm and who they are hiring.